study this evening, and it's only one chapter, but we're going to do a whole lesson on it in our New Testament survey. Philemon. It's right after Titus, right before Hebrews. It's the last in order of Paul's epistles, and it's the shortest of Paul's epistles. Uh, one chapter, 25 verses, 430 words. It was written during the apostles' first imprisonment in Rome in the early 60s, probably around 62 A.D. And he alludes to his imprisonment again and again throughout this epistle. I think it's six times. Uh, there's, he makes reference to the fact that he's in prison uh, notice that he expected to be released in verse 22, but with all prepare me also a lodging for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. And so we've talked about the fact there were two imprisonments. Paul was a prisoner in Rome. As we see him going to Rome at the end of the book of Acts, he gets there, he's in prison, he writes uh, epistles like Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and, and, and Philemon. He's released, we believe, for a time. He writes 1 Timothy and Titus, but he's in prison again. He writes 2 Timothy, his last epistle. And uh, But by the way, that verse 22 is a great verse showing you that prayer makes a difference. And I don't pretend to understand how it all works, but God uses our prayers. And uh, some people say, well, God already knows everything, and he already has a perfect will for everything, so what difference does it make to pray? Here's a verse in Paul's epistles which shows that prayers can make a difference in our daily life. Paul's in prison. He's saying, I'm trusting that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Now, I believe the main thing about prayer is it's communion with the Lord. And if, we, and, and if nothing ever happened as far as results are concerned, from prayer, it'd be worth praying just to talk with God, worship God, thank God, and just commune with God. But we're, we're told to make our requests known and that the Lord works. And of course, we don't always get what we ask. We don't even know how to pray as we ought, but we can trust the Lord that he'll work things out. He'll give us peace. But I've heard some guys talking about prayer in regard to right division almost makes it sound like it makes no difference at all in this age to pray. Uh, I don't know anybody who would admit that, but I've heard people say things that may, almost implied that, and I don't believe that. I, I think that it, it can make a difference, and here's Paul himself saying that Philemon's prayers would make a difference, right? That God would use his prayers. Isn't that what he said? He said, I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. That's, that's uh, very clear that God would use, the, and God does use our prayers. And... Um, we just pray the best we know how, trusting the Lord, and the Holy Ghost makes intercession, and the Son of God makes intercession, and um, He'll work all things out according to His will. And uh, we don't always get exactly what we ask for, but in the blessing when you see a, a direct result of prayer where God did something on the basis of, of, of through your prayers. I've seen that in my life, and I'd like to see it more. It's a great encouragement. It's a blessing. So don't get fatalistic about prayer, in other words. Don't say, well, God's, all, God, God's already got everything you know, under control, and he knows all things. What will be, will be, and so on. And Well, God knows all things, but he does give man a will, and, uh, and we make choices. And I don't personally believe, and I don't know how I got off into this already. I'm not even, I've departed from my notes within a minute of the lesson <laughs> But I, I don't believe that everything is just set in stone before the foundation of the world. God already knows, but he does give us the freedom to choose. And there, there, there are scenarios that you can't, well, I, I don't want to get into all that. I'm going to, I got to get back to the lesson. We're never going to get through this. But just, just, just know that God can use our prayers, okay? And so I actually read the verse just to show you that... <laughs> Uh, Paul was expecting to be released, and he was, by the way, wasn't he? We believe he was released, and then, but he was imprisoned again later. So Philemon is probably the most neglected 
an overlooked epistle. And that's one of the reasons why I want to give a whole lesson to it tonight. Now, I've taught through it verse by verse before, and I don't feel like I've neglected it in my personal ministry, but you know as well as I do, you don't hear many messages out of Philemon. A lot of people probably don't even know there's a book in the Bible called Philemon. And uh, it's kind of like Amos or Obadiah. You know, who's Amos? You know, th isn't that a, a cookie company, famous Amos or something? Or Philemon, is that a Jamaican? Phil Phil Philemon. Hey, Philemon. <laughs> I mean, who, who is this <laughs> Philemon? I kid around because uh, I said that for my kids' benefit because our dog Shasta is a Siberian husky, but he actually has a Jamaican accent. And uh, you, you come to our house, we'll prove it to you. But he'll carry a conversation with you, and it's a Jamaican. He's, a, he's from Siberia, but it's funny because he has a Jamaican accent. Okay. When I was growing up, my dad, every pet we had, my dad had a voice and a personality for them. And I did not purposely do that, but I have found myself repeating that, you know. And uh, anyway, I even have a voice for my daughter's bird, Mr. Pickles. And he talks like Batman. But anyway, we'll get back to the lesson. <laughs> uh, I won't do that one for you, though. I'll save that for another time. <laughs> but Philemon's very overlooked, but it, it contains many spiritual principles. Uh, there's a lot in, in here for us to apply. For example, it, it's a great demonstration of uh, brotherly love. Uh, between Paul and Philemon, and uh, Christian courtesy. The way Paul writes this is just, it's a masterpiece in Christian tact <laughs> and courtesy. And forgiveness is, is a theme here, uh, between brethren. And it, uh, but, but not only spiritual principles, it contains a spiritual picture of great doctrinal truth concerning salvation in Christ. So it's well worth our study. Now on the surface, it may seem like just a personal letter between two friends. So why is this in the Word of God? And how are we uh, to be edified by it? The books of the Bible are arranged according to a divine order, as we've pointed out many times. And it is fitting, I believe, that this is placed at the end of Paul's epistles, because while it does not set forth doctrinal truth and practical exhortation in the same way that um, his other epistles do, it illustrates both through a real life situation. This really happened, and it's an illustration of Paul's teaching. And Paul, by the grace of God, was a great example of the doctrines that he taught and stood for. Uh, Charles Baker wrote this. He said, This brief epistle is strictly personal in nature, containing nothing of a doctrinal or dispensational nature. Uh, Paul's attitude, however, in relation uh, to the runaway slave Onesimus does represent and reflect in a remarkable way the grace message which Paul preached. So it's, it's kind of like an illustration at the end of his epistles. Now, Paul referred to Philemon as his dearly beloved and his fellow laborer. But all we know about Philemon is derived from this epistle. Uh, he was a believer saved through Paul's ministry. If you look in verse 19, he said, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides and the implication is the Lord had used Paul in a great way in Philemon's life, no doubt leading him to Christ and teaching him uh, the truth. And uh, he lived in Colossae. We can, we can glean that by comparing Philemon with Colossians 4. And if you were to look at especially verses 7 through 17 in Colossians 4 and compare it with some things in Philemon, it would be very clear to you that Philemon uh, was in Colossae. And we can also glean that he was evidently a wealthy man. He was one who owned servants and uh, that he had a house large enough for the church to meet in. And the implications were he was a man of means. 
Um, but the point of the letter is that one of his servants, Onesimus, had run away, and perhaps he had stolen from him. I gleaned that from verse 18. It says, if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. He probably did owe Philemon, because he, when he ran away to be able to make his trip, he probably stole from him. And, uh, but he ended up in Rome. And while in Rome, he meets the Apostle Paul. And how that happened, we don't know. No details are given as to how he met Paul in prison at Rome. Maybe Philemon himself wound up in prison or working in the prison. We don't know. But Paul leads him to the Lord. In verse 10, Paul said, I beseech thee for my son. And again, like we saw with Timothy and Titus, this is his son in a spiritual sense. My son Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my bond. So Paul as a prisoner. By the way, Paul as a prisoner, what sitting there bitter and defeated, he was still serving the Lord, leading people to Christ. In fact, he had, there were many saints in Caesar's own household as a result of Paul's testimony. You, you pick that up at the end of Philippians. But he had led Onesimus to the Lord. Now, Roman law permitted a master to execute a rebellious servant. But Philemon was a godly man, and Paul was confident that he would forgive Onesimus and that he would welcome him back, uh, not only as a servant, but more than that, as now a brother in Christ. And so Paul, in this letter, is a mediator between his new convert and his old friend. That's what this letter is about. He's a mediator between his new convert and his old friend. Now, he does not command Philemon as an apostle. He doesn't say, Philemon, I'm the apostle Paul, do as I say, or I will deliver thee unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You know? he, he doesn't uh, use his authority. What he does, he writes as Paul the aged. And he writes as a Christian gentleman, and he writes as a friend of Philemon, and he beseeches him. He pleads with him. And he writes with a lot of feeling. By the way, there's nothing wrong with feelings. You know, I, sometimes we get the wrong idea. We think feelings don't have a part in a Christian walk because we condemn the feeling-driven type of Christianity that's so prevalent. We ought to be faith-driven. We walk by faith, not by feelings. But feelings, if they're in subjection to faith... Feelings, when they're in their right place, are, are important. We ought to have a, a, a desire uh, for the Lord and, and to serve others. We ought to have feelings. We ought to have Christian uh, charity, which is, charity is not a feeling, it's an action, but I think there, there ought to be some, uh, well, he uses the word bowels three times in Philemon. Now, that's not, you know, when we hear that word today, uh, it's not commonly used today the way Paul was using it, but the way Paul was using it, it's like the heart, uh, something deep. Uh, it would, it, and, and the reason why I associate it with the heart is because the Bible does. Look, hold a marker in Philemon, go all the way back to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Really, the bowels, and, that, and Paul refers to that quite a bit, it's like compassionate feelings, something deep within. And in Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 19, the weeping prophet said, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very, what? Heart. My heart maketh the noise in me. He's talking about his heart. He said, my bowels. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As we often tell you, study words in the Bible itself, the King James Bible, and you'll understand the words. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 11. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. 
So he's contrasting his enlarged heart with their straightened or narrowed down uh, bowels. And, and so you see that they're related there. It's, it's compassionate feelings from the heart is basically what that's referring to. So this is a letter of deep feeling. He refers to uh, the bowels in verse 7, in verse 12, in verse 20. Now, he sent, if you go back to Philemon, he sent Onesimus back to his master with this letter in which he intercedes to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. And so here, here is this runaway slave that's now a Christian and he's going back to his master and he's carrying this letter that Paul's making intercession for him. And I think he not only had this letter, he had the epistle to the Colossians. And some think even to the Ephesians. I know for sure Colossians, because in Colossians chapter 4, he said in verse uh, 7 through 9, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your, est your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. So he's from Colossae. Well, if he's from Colossae, that means Philemon was from Colossae, right? They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Paul sends Onesimus back to Colossae with this letter and also Tychicus. And so that's just kind of what this letter is about. And to, to give you a simple outline, I, I provide in your handout a couple outlines. Um, the first outline I give you is this. In verses 1 through 3, we have the greeting. And then verses 4 through 7, we have Philemon's character. And then verses 8 through 21, which is really the heart of the epistle, is the intercession for Onesimus. And then the conclusion, verses 22 through 25. Another outline is this, appreciation for Philemon. He said in verse 4, I thank my God. And he's thanking God for Philemon. And then you have appeal for Onesimus. Look in verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. And then you have assurance by Paul. Look at verse 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. So, simple outline. I tell you what, let's do. Let's read through these 25 verses, and then we'll come back and say some more things about it. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and, and that's probably his wife he's referring to. It's a female name. It's most likely his wife. And Archippus, our fellow soldier, that's probably his son. And to the church and thy house. So he's writing to Philemon personally, and he, and, he's, and he sends greetings to his family and to the church that's meeting in his house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith. Uh, you know, again and again, Paul looks for those things in believers. He wants to see their love and their faith and their hope, right? These are things that come up so often in his epistles, as we've been showing you in our study of 1 Thessalonians. He said, Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, whenever I read verse 6, I think about what Paul said in Romans 7. Uh, I believe it's verse 18 where he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So, guess what's good about your flesh? Nothing. All right? But here he writes and says... Every good thing which is in you. But see, the key is, he said, in Christ Jesus. See, in my flesh, nothing good. But Christ lives in me. And obviously, he is good. And so I can live a good life. I can be a good person in the Lord. All right? People talk about, well, so-and-so is a good person. Not unless they're saved. The Bible said there's none that doeth good. No, not one. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. See, we think people are good by our standard, but our standard is not very good. <laughs> God's standard is, the, is what we need to go by. Verse 7, For we have great joy 
and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. And that's, that's a theme we've, we see in Paul's epistles, this idea of refreshment. Uh, we don't want to be the type of people that when, when we're around people, they think, oh, boy. <laughs> you know, It's like a drudgery. It's like, oh, here they come, and what are they? Oh, I hate when they come up and tell me all this stuff they're going to do. You know, it's like, oh, here we go. We, don't want, we, we want to be the type of people, people are like, oh, I can't wait to talk to so-and-so. They're always such a refreshment. Are you a refreshment or a grief? May God help us to be a refreshment to people, right? He said, Wherefore, though I might be much, uh, be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, in other words, to command thee, that which is in, uh, convenient, in other words, this would be what I'm asking you to do is convenient, in other words, proper, fitting, suitable. He said, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee. And... Um, it's better for people to willingly choose to do right out of love than to be forced to do right out of necessity. He said, I'd rather beseech thee for love's sake. Um, yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech thee being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. If you can't see a spiritual picture in that, you're blind. I mean, good night. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But talking about unprofitable, that's exactly what we were. But now in Christ, we can serve God profitably. He said, whom I have sinned again, thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. In other words, receive him as one that is very dear to my own heart. Whom I would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel, but without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. That's another one of those statements. We were a lost sinner for a season, but we're a child of God forever. <laughs> He said, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He said, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. What a statement when you think about it in relation to salvation. That's what Christ says to the Father on our behalf. Receive him as, as me. If he hath owed thee or if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Again, that's what Christ said. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Isn't it a joyful thing to see people doing the right thing? From the heart, out of love. In this day and age, that's real refreshing because it's not real common. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. Knowing, now this is a great statement, that thou will also do more than I say. Now that's refreshing. When you find a person who goes the extra mile, so to speak. Are you the type of person that just gets by doing what's expected? Or do you go above and beyond? The people who go above and beyond are real refreshing. I know some, I believe we have folks like that here in our church. What a blessing that is. May God help us all to be that way. That uh, we're, we're not just going to do what's expected. We, we want to do more than that. We want to we abound in our Christian service to take initiative and to follow through. I mean, if you find somebody who could take initiative to do something, follow through in doing it, and then go above and beyond in doing it, now that's refreshing. Yeah. Right? Because that's not common, is it, unfortunately? He said, But with all prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. 
there salute thee. So when you compare what he's about to say with Colossians 4, he mentions the same people. So you know there, he's, that Philemon's in Colossae because he's saying, There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, let me just say some more about this. It's just a blessing to read. It's a great letter. There's a lot in it for us. But you know, the scripture does not say that Philemon was a preacher. Now, there's some debate about this. Some people think he was the pastor at, at uh, Colossae. Uh, I, I personally don't think that. Um, the Bible doesn't say he was a pastor, or it doesn't say he was a preacher, an evangelist, or whatever. But he was what all believers should be, and that's a fellow laborer in the work of the ministry. You see in verse 17, he said, If thou count me therefore a partner. That's what a fellow laborer is. A partner in a common labor. We're laborers together with God. That, that's what a fellow laborer is. And that word fellow laborer is associated with the word fellowship. Our fellowship should be centered around our labor for the Lord. Paul talked about in Philippians 1, our, he said, your fellowship in the gospel. He said the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 3. He talked about Timothy as far as being uh, his fellowship and in, in, in the, in the work of the gospel. Notice also the terms fellow soldier. In verse 2, he refers to Archippus, a fellow soldier, and then fellow prisoner. In verse number 23, Epaphras, a fellow prisoner. And Paul liked those fellow words. He, he used a lot of those in his epistles. And uh, this idea of a partnership. Now, ministry involves much more than preaching behind a pulpit. You can be in the ministry without getting up and preaching a sermon. I, I believe we need businessmen in the local church who, like Philemon, will be fellow laborers in the ministry. Uh, we can't all stand behind the pulpit and preach the message. It, it takes people out there in the world working and they have the ability to help provide for the cause of Christ and provide for the local church. And, of course, they're a witness on their job and, and their influence. And, and look, away with this nonsense that unless you're a preacher, you're not in the ministry. And that, that, people have this mindset that if you don't go to Bible college, which I don't recommend, by the way, it'll mess you up more than likely. But if you don't go to Bible college and then you don't get on a church staff, you know, People say, do you have staph? I said, no, I don't have staph infection. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, and I, what I mean by that is, the, is the, uh, the welfare program that some churches have. Well, they get a lot of guys drawing a paycheck, don't do nothing, you know, and they don't know how to work at all. They just kind of, uh, well, anyway, I, I think that if you need, if, and look, uh, uh, the right kind of local church is going to have so much involvement from its members, you're not going to need a big staff. I think the local church ought to, the people working together ought to get the job done. Right, uh, but if they're if if the size of the church and the ministry demands another full time person in that work, great. But a lot of that it's just like a status symbol where a pastor walks out on the platform and has all his duds sitting there in the chairs behind him. Boy, he looks like he's you know really a powerful man. He's got all these people working for him and all that nonsense, you know. You ever seen that? Some of these churches, they literally when the service starts, the pastor comes out the door and all this. Robots follow in right behind them, and they all sit down in the chairs and amen everything he says. The pastor can burp and they amen, you know, just a bunch of, well, anyway. I was going to use a term that I probably shouldn't, so I'm glad I stopped myself. Just nonsense, okay? Now, again, there's a right uh, place for that. But I'm just saying is that, look, I like Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers, and Paul considered them some of the greatest helpers he had in the ministry. And look, a woman, too. Uh, the, the wife didn't just stay out of the work. There's a place for women in the ministry. And I don't see how people can read Paul's epistles and think women don't have a place in the ministry. Just because they're not in leadership in a church, and just because they're not preaching, they still have a mighty important role to fill. Matter of fact, you look, some of you look at me doubtful. 
All right? Some people, you're not. I'm just going to prove it anyway. But Philippians 4, uh, people think Paul was against women. No. He wrote by inspiration of God, and he wrote what God said about things concerning the proper order. And being in the proper order is not anti-woman. If, if a woman gets out of order, that's going to be against her. She's much better off in her proper place, right? In the, in the right order of things. I don't know why a woman would want to come off the pedestal God put her on and try to act like a man. You know, I mean, why, why would you want that? Uh, why would a woman want to go dig a ditch, you know? I mean, what, what's with these people? I remember in high school this girl trying to tell me she could play baseball as well as I. That was the biggest laugh I ever had in my life. Let me tell you something. You might be a good softball player, but you get up the bat and let me pitch to you, you're going to change your mind about what you just said. And I said, you pitch to me, and I'm going to hit it over the fence so far. Anyway, I said a few things like that. and was, I don't like that stuff. Quit try, uh, Women trying to be like men and men trying to be like, this is a messed up society, you know. Good night. But women do have a proper, and it wasn't my wife, by the way. She didn't talk to me in high school. She, she, <laughs> we didn't start talking until after I graduated. She, she, she knew who I was, but she had anything to do with me because I wasn't living for the Lord yet, and she was wise. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, he said in verse number uh, 3, I, I entreat thee also, true yoke fella, help the, there's one of those fellow words there, we're in the yoke together serving the Lord. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Those women which labored with me in the gospel. Again, look, Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple serving the Lord together, a great help to Paul. Paul says a lot of great things about them. And I like how they, they took Apollos aside, that eloquent preacher, that eloquent Baptist preacher. <laughs> and they took him aside and showed him the way of God more perfectly. You know, and, uh, and Apollos had the humility to listen to some people who knew more about the, the, the truth of God than he did. And I wish all Baptist preachers were like Apollos in that sense. But here's Philemon, and his whole family's involved in the ministry. Hey, his wife must have been pretty spiritual to let a church meet in her house. <laughs> That's not the most convenient thing to do. And his son's a preacher, it seems. If you go to Colossians 4, he talks about Archippus fulfilling his ministry. And the implication was that he was a preacher. And so here's Philemon's uh, leading his family to serve the Lord uh, together. And so that we need people like that if the church is going to be able to do the work of God. Philemon was not too busy to serve the Lord. And he served the Lord with his family. How important that is. You know, a Christian home... How important that is. The, the, the church, the local church, will be as solid as its homes. Right? Uh, and a Christian home is more than a Christian family living in the same house. It is a Christian family living out their faith on a daily basis and serving the Lord together. You know, praying together, reading the Bible together, going to church together, and doing things in the ministry together. Now, let me say a few things more about this letter. A couple more things I want to get across before we close. Why? And I won't say much on this because I've taught on this before, but let me just mention, why did Paul send Onesimus back to his master? Isn't that like the pressing question that comes to mind when you read this? Why didn't he rebuke Philemon for having servants? Why did he write this letter instead of Uncle Philemon's cabin? What's the deal? There are several passages in Paul's epistles where he exhorts, and this, this comes up more than once, okay? He exhorts servants to be good servants and to, and to serve their masters as unto the Lord. And he also exhorts masters to be good to their servants and to remember they have a master in heaven. Now that's just the truth of it. The fact is, uh, and this is a can of worms that I don't really want to open up right now, but just to say that under the law, for an example, God did not prohibit Israel from having servants, but he regulated it. And in our mindset, our modern Western mindset, we can't grasp this. But God is just. 
and God is perfect, and God makes no mistakes, and the fact is we live in a fallen world. And not everything is, it's not heaven on earth, okay? Servant being, a, slavery is a reality that has existed from the fall, and it still exists today. And all these people in America that want to bring up something that happened several hundred years ago in our country, I don't know why they don't put their passion toward helping actual slaves in the world today. You know, this whole concept of reparations. What a, what a blasphemy. You're going to tell me I need to pay you something because my great-great-great-grandpappy enslaved yours? I didn't have nothing to do with it, and you didn't have nothing to do with it. Time to move on, right? Hey, man, my folks came from Ireland. Man, we were mistreated. And some of my folks came from Poland. We're still mistreated. I mean, I could get a chip on my shoulder about stuff like that, you know? Every race of people has been mistreated. It's a wicked world. Right? And um, so just, the, I'm not trying to be insensitive, okay? But I, I'm just trying to be honest about this thing as far as how it's dealt with in the Word of God. You know, all believers are spiritually one in Christ and enjoy spiritual liberty in Him, Right? We're all one. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. We're all one spiritually. However, on this earth, there are still social, physical, earthly distinctions. A saved woman has the same spiritual standing before God as her saved husband. But in this life, she needs to submit to his leadership. I mean, look. When Paul writes Ephesians, he's talking about the one body and, the, and that glorious standing we all have as members of one body. And then in the same epistle, he says, wives, submit to your husband, children, obey your parents, servants, obey your masters. Right? So standing in state, standing in state. So a saved servant has the same spiritual standing before God as a saved master, but in this life he must still obey his master's authority. See, Paul, the point is, Paul did not preach a social gospel. Like, you know, he wasn't like Al Sharpton or anything like that. That's for sure. And slavery has existed in this world since the fall. Like I said a moment ago, it's a reality the church has not been called to make the world a better place to go to hell from. Okay, If you put all your efforts into ending slavery and, and slaves die and go to hell, did you really help them that much? I mean, comparatively speaking to eternity? See, we're called to get sinners saved out of this present evil world. And if Paul would have told servants to run away... It would have been against the law, it would have endangered the servants, and worst of all, it would have hindered the gospel. What a powerful testimony for a Christian servant to be the best servant he could for his master. What a testimony that would be to an unsaved master. And what a testimony to be for a saved master like Philemon to treat his servants so good that they would want to stay in servant. Right? So when it came to... Things like this for Paul, it was all about personal responsibility, not personal rights. See, that's what it is in our culture, rights. Rights. I have rights. No, Christians have the responsibility to follow God, to put others before ourselves, and put the furtherance of the gospel before ourselves. Paul was willing to lay down his life for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but you can go to 1 Corinthians 7, about verses 20 through 24, and also 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 through 5, and see the, this uh, tone that Paul takes, saying that servants ought to be content in that lot in life, and uh, they are free in the Lord, and uh, that they ought to just submit to that. And, and, and so there's a lot you can get into there, but it's just something that's very, look, different from our modern culture. But we don't change the Bible to match our culture. We don't sit in judgment on the Word of God because we've been ingrained with a different mindset in our modern culture. Now let me point this out to you. By sending Onesimus back to his master,
Paul was disobeying the law. And he knew it. Don't you think Paul knew the law? With his background, he knew the law very well. You know what it says in Deuteronomy 23? You probably don't, so let me read it to you. I don't know what it says until I turn and look at it here. Deuteronomy 23, verse number 15. <clears throat> Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. Isn't that what Paul does in this letter? You know what that means? We're not under the law, but under grace. Philemon is about grace, not about law. You see that? All right. The Word of God not only plainly states the truth, it also illustrates it through types and pictures. And this little epistle provides us with a beautiful picture of salvation by grace. Think about what we just read. As we read through it and we've talked about what's in it, listen, Onesimus represents lost sinners, Philemon represents God the Father, and Paul represents God the Son. Now, there are three great doctrinal truths concerning salvation by grace that are revealed and explained in Paul's epistles that are illustrated by this real-life situation that took place between Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon. Number one, mediation. Look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He is being a mediator. The truth that Christ is the mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the go-between. We couldn't get to the Father but through the Son. He takes the Father by one hand and he takes the sinner and he makes reconciliation. He's the go-between. He's the mediator and the only mediator between God and men. Imputation, not amputation. Imputation. <clears throat> Verse 18, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. To impute something is to put it on the account of. Well, the truth that Christ took our sin and gives believers his righteousness, that's, that's a wonderful doctrine in 2 Corinthians 5, for an example. It talks about reconciliation. It says that God reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And that um, in verse 21 it says, For he hath made him, God the Father hath made God the Son, to be sin for us, uh, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So our sin was imputed to Christ on the cross. He paid for our sins. When we trust him, his righteousness is imputed to us. Wonderful doctrine. It's right here in Philemon illustrated. And then identification. Verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Well, that's the truth that God now receives the believer as he does Christ. If you can't get a blessing out of that, you, you just, you're dead and you haven't fallen down yet. I mean, that is, that is any Christian that thinks on that ought to just rejoice Look, I can't come to God in my flesh, and my flesh dwells no good thing. But again, he said, Philemon, there are many good things in you in Christ. Why? He's accepted us in the Beloved. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 6, that we're accepted in the Beloved. The Beloved is the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, look, I get a kick out of this, man. God the Father said, concerning the Lord Jesus, in his earthly ministry, several times he said, This is my Beloved Son. In whom I am well pleased. He couldn't look at me and say I'm well pleased. He'd look at me and say, I ought to put you in hell. But I trusted Christ. And now he looks at me and says, I'm well pleased. Because of Jesus Christ. Boy, what a blessing that is. Identification. And that's why it's so imperative that we emphasize one spiritual baptism because that's how we are identified with Christ. You, you mark it down, the churches that emphasize water over spiritual baptism, you mark it down, those people sitting in that church aren't grounded in this truth. 
They think the best identification is to get up one time in front of some people and, and get water on them, and that's the best way to identify with Christ. No, identification is a living union whereby we're baptized by one spirit into one body, thereby being crucified with them, buried with them, risen with them, and thereby able to walk in newness of life. And you ought to identify with Christ every day of your life by living that out. That is what matters. And so we have this identification. God receives us as he does Christ. You see that? The spiritual baptism is what God does, and we're complete in him. Why would you want to exalt a work that man does? Right? Think about it. Very, very important we understand this. <laughs> My son... Colton is making some faces that are, I'm trying not to laugh. I, and you're about to get me there, buddy. <laughs> I guess that means he's done with his lesson, you know. But hey, he's four years old, so I guess we can't blame him. But he, if you would have saw the faces he was just making, I was trying my best not to, to look over there. I, I, did I embarrass you, Colton? He's not looking at me. Well, see, you shouldn't have been making those faces. He gets it from me, though. I can't be too hard. I used to do the same thing in school. <laughs> we finish with this. <laughs> the name Onesimus means profitable. Isn't that kind of interesting? Because he said in verse number 11, which in time past was to the unprofitable. But now, isn't that language kind of familiar? I mean, you remind you of something in Paul's epistles, time past, but now. <laughs> We think of it dispensationally, but even practically in our life. In time past, I was unprofitable to God. But now that I'm saved, I can, I can live a life that's profitable. And that's something. I'm not wasting my life. And if, and if you don't know the Lord and you're not serving the Lord, you are wasting your life. Be as steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. In the Lord. He said he wasn't profitable, but now profitable. In time past, he had been an unprofitable servant to Philemon, but now he was saved. Now that he was saved, he was profitable. And based on how he had served Paul in prison, Paul had confidence that Onesimus would be an excellent servant for, for Philemon. You know what? Salvation not only changes our hereafter, it changes us here and now. Evidently, Onesimus desired to return to his master he had wronged. That's the implication. I don't see where Paul's forcing Onesimus to go back. Onesimus did Philemon wrong. Now that he's saved, he wants to make that right. You know what? Those that are right with God want to be right with others. Now let me just say this, because you get a lot of psychology type stuff being preached today. If somebody does you wrong and they don't repent of it and they don't want to be restored, it's not up to you to fix that. You understand? Somebody does me wrong and they come to me and they say, you know what, I, I acknowledge what I did was wrong. I'll be more than happy to be reconciled in that. But even the Lord Jesus taught that forgiveness was conditioned on repentance right in the sense of remember when he taught that about forgiving others he said if your brother offends you and he repents you and he said 70 times seven just keep doing it as long as but again if they don't want to be paul said as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men not everybody wants to be restored or reconciled and god's not going to hold you accountable for somebody doing you wrong and not wanting to make it right with you You know, because you hear the stuff preached like somebody does you wrong and you're the one that's supposed to go fix it because you're such a great Christian. I don't think that's really helping the situation when you go to them, it's kind of like telling them that somehow you're taking the blame. You're taking the responsibility. Just trust the Lord to work on their heart. Maybe they'll come around later. In time past, before salvation, we were unprofitable to God. Read it in Romans 3. He talks about the sinfulness of man, and he even uses the word unprofitable. They are all together unprofitable. 
But now in Christ, we are made profitable. In Romans 3, he goes on to talk about how we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And you look in Ephesians 2 and see that we were the lowest of the low dead sinners. Now we're lifted up higher than the highest, seated with Christ in heavenly places. And 1 Timothy 4, 8 says that godliness is profitable for the life that now is and that which is to come. Aren't you glad you can live a profitable life for the glory of God? Hey, you ought to get a blessing tonight out of a lot of things we looked at, especially that we're accepted in the beloved. Let's never get over that glorious truth. Our Father, thank you for Philemon that you put it in the Bible for us and what a blessing it is.